allow me to introduce Anne Coldiron. And again, Anne, thanks so much for coming. Professor of English at Florida State University is the author of Canon Period and Poetry of, well, Charles Duc d'Orléans. And the subtitle, Found in Translation, 2000 publication, and English Printing, Verse Translation, and the Battle of the Sexes, 1476 to 1557, 2009 publication. Her research appears in the Yale Journal of Criticism and Critical Readings and Translation Studies, 2010. Her lecture is titled, Printers Without Borders, Historical Issues in the Study of Early Modern Translations. Anne, please join me in welcoming Anne Coldang. Well, thanks for that nice welcome, and thanks especially to Bob Hodgson, Phil Towner, Stefano Arduini, and Dulce Alvarado, whose hard work and generosity have made it possible for all of us to come together today and talk about these topics. Um, I'd like to start with an overview uh, of this presentation. Let's see. There we go. Don't worry, you're not going to have to stare at. Uh, words on a screen for an entire hour just for the first 15 minutes of the introduction. Um, in May of 2012, in a special issue of Translation Studies, Christopher Rundle argued that historical studies and translation studies are simply incompatible, and I'm quoting him, these are two different fields of research that use neither the same methodologies nor the same discourse. Well, as a literary historian interested in both history and theory of translation, I am entirely untroubled. Indeed, I am intrigued and delighted by the methodological and discursive differences between our two fields. And I begin from the premise that they're not at odds, but present two interlocking heuristics, two supportive frameworks of inquiry. The same problematics arise in both representation and rhetoric, evidence and epistemology. Unlike other texts, translations by definition occupy two or more temporal positions. Both embedded and transtemporal, they invite, they invite both synchronic and diachronic inquiry. And each field keeps the other honest in a way. We in translation studies challenge nation and period history's main organizing categories. Just as translations themselves challenge the major literary categories of authorship, influence, reception, periodization, and as Professor McMurrin's excellent book has recently demonstrated, literary genre. So it's a shallow translation theory that ignores history and a narrow history that hides inside one language or culture. I see no methodological problems here that we cannot turn into methodological advantage just by attending well to one another and to the different kinds of evidence that we bring. We need each other. Furthermore, there's no one way to join translation and history, but rather a whole range of possibilities, just a few of which I hope to illustrate in the cases today. And the cases, the cases today, whoops, the cases today will uh, focus on the Renaissance or early modern period uh, as a most useful site of inquiry for joining historical methods and translation studies. And I'm using the term Renaissance and early modern more or less interchangeably in the talk, but of course they signify different things. Uh, we can talk about that later if you want. Um, so I'd like to pause here and just remind ourselves of a few of the characteristics that make the Renaissance such a key phase among the many factors before expanding on one in particular. Obviously, first, the 16th century was a great age of translation. Uh, by many estimates, over half of what was printed in the 16th and 17th centuries was translation. The age's broadest cultural agendas required translation. The recovery of the classical past, increased travel and trade among known neighbors, the discovery of new neighbors in new worlds, scientific discoveries, all these required and stimulated translation. Early modern education was founded on what we now call double translation. Nearly every literate person in England got that way by practicing translation and back translation in a specific process from about the age of six. 
The, the residual multilingualism of law French and church Latin in England, not to mention spoken vernaculars and dialects of several kinds, held their polyglot sway for a full century after the national vernacular had been declared dominant in law and also in fact. Translations aimed to English it all. Furthermore, paratexts attached to the vast early modern translated corpora contained more and more commentary and discussion about translation. This was the era when the translator's preface, which had been rooted in the medieval accesus ad auctores, that very conventionalized space, suddenly flowers into its own subgenre in the 16th century. These translator's prefaces contain rich evidence about theory and practice that is so far largely unassembled. Now, we all know the main high points, Florio, Wilson, Hobie, and the end point of Dryden, but there's a whole lot of undiscovered commentary out there in these um, uh, early modern texts. Why don't we have this available to us? Well, modern editorial habits of suppressing paratexts have made this so, and that's being remedied now with our new digital tools um, and new archival tools. Especially in the 16th century, translation-related controversies were urgent. Questions of language choice, lexical borrowing and change, the inkhorn term controversies, the meter and rhyme debates that ran throughout the latter part of the century, questions of aesthetic and formal practice in literature, for instance. These were urgent and important questions all related to translation. More generally, early modern writers saw the power of translation to create and develop national literatures, not to mention uh, translation's role in national spying, national diplomacy, and national propaganda. <laughs> plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Um, like other historical phenomena, early modern nationhoods were shaped internally by translation and articulated outside themselves through translation. I won't even mention biblical and theological texts or the Reformation in which translation has additional centrality and power as this society knows quite well. Nor shall I note significant advances in Renaissance lexicography, mathematics, and especially cryptography, most relevant to translation. So those are just a few of the, of the many factors that make the early modern period or the Renaissance a kind of a hot spot or key site of inquiry for joining historical and translation studies. And even about these very well-known matters, there's still a whole lot left to learn and discover. But the signal fact I'd like to talk about today is something else, something that involves and underpins all those other factors and that is itself transhistorical um, in a way. That is the Renaissance information revolution um, and its relevance to us in translation studies. Since the late 15th century, when printing became historiographer's primary means of production, favored means of production, we've received our history through printed texts. Although the advent of printing, too, is well studied among historians, we in translation studies have only recently begun to examine seriously the relation between printing and translation or media and translation. Now, book trade historians do tend to talk about internationalism uh, in the book trades, but what I'm interested in is something much more directly verbal and textual. Um, certain specific practical facts about the world of early printing link translation tightly with the new technology and thus link translation studies and history. My focus is on England today and on the first phases of this Renaissance media revolution between 1476 and 1557. And these are key dates because 1476 is the year that William Caxton, England's first printer, brought a press from the continent to Westminster. And 1557 is the date of the royal charter of the Company of Stationers. Beyond a broad general debt to translators, the literary culture of the English Renaissance owes a great deal to the early printers who made thousands of works available to expanding readerships in a relatively short time. Early modern England's media revolution was a special case in a way. Um, we might relate this to what Andrew Pedigree says about the English, English exception, that the early modern English world was exceptional and not like what was happening in the rest of the, of the Western world. Printers and translators in England worked almost completely in an appropriative direction to import works into English. And this contrasts with printing in, say, Paris or Lyon, where the printers tended to produce both import translation and export translation. In other words, printers were translating and producing books 
um, bringing them into French, but also um, exporting from French into multiple vernaculars and into Latin. And they did this both seriatim and in patterns that I've called uh, radiant patterns or simultaneous compressed patterns. The, the English situation is, is really quite different from uh, that of the continent, and it's relatively simple, unidirectional. There are practical reasons for the strong patter pattern of importation translation in England. Most of England's first and second generation printers were bilingual polyglot immigrant foreigners. The Act of 1484 encouraged foreigners specifically to enter England as press workers, as printers, apprentices, and journeymen, and gave them the right to trade in, in books without tariffs. Many early printers in England were themselves translators of the books they printed. One thinks of Caxton, for example, a Francophone bilingual who learned to print from Dutchmen and Frenchmen in Bruges, Burgundians in Bruges. Eighty percent of Caxton's texts were translated from French and the deeply Burgundian aesthetic that Caxton established in his printed translations persists throughout the English Renaissance. Likewise, his prolific successor, Wynkin de Word, like other printers, Robert Weyer, Robert Copeland, Julien Le Notaire, Simon Vautre, François Regnault, yes, they were working in England. They were Francophone printers who translated and then printed the books that they produced. Henry VIII's King print, King's printer, Richard Penson, was a Francophone native of Normandy. So that tells you that there's a, a deep uh, Francophone foundation beneath the world of English books, English printed books. Not only the printers and their texts set this foreign Francophone weighted foundation for the Renaissance media revolution in England, their physical equipment too came from the Francophone continent, right down to the typefaces and the paper itself. Uh, recently, John Bidwell has explained that there was very little paper made in England, native paper, until the very end of the 16th century. But there were so many kinds of French papers uh, that they developed regional names, and as we now name cheeses and wines. Oh, let's, let's print that on a roquefort. Let, let's, let's print this on some bleu. Uh, that tells you the variety and uh, flood of French papers into England. Book aesthetics, typefaces, decorations, bindings, the crucial guidance structures of mise en page, these too came to England in foreign forms. Practically speaking then, translation was a seamless part of early English book production, right alongside the setting of type, the inking of the leathers, the pulling of the press, the correction, hanging, folding, and quiring of the sheets. Translation and printing were textual co-practices. Theoretically, too, they acted as mutually catalytic processes of textual transformation. And here we might want to bring in from book history Randall McLeod's theory of transformation. Um, he, sees this, he sees that the material incarnation of a work carries an implicit hermeneutic, and when textual transmission occurs, transformation necessarily occurs. He's not talking about translation, and yet what he says speaks directly to us. All right, so um, additionally linking translation and history now, since in England these co-practices were focused on the appropriative Englishing and reducing of foreign materials, as they called it, they enacted an impulse toward nation formation. That's, that too is much studied and well understood by scholars since Richard Helgerson's book, Forms of Nationhood, and is especially known in work by Andrew Hadfield and Claire McAkern and others following them. Yet the foreignness of the English Renaissance media revolution shows us also an irritating, opposing, multilingual and international impulse. Translation practice in the period defies our models of subversion and containment. And so to examine printing and translation together is to change what we think about early modern nationhoods. We will see this friction, especially in the last two cases I have for you today. We will get to the cases very soon. So. If every translation records an interpretive encounter with alterity, then I see as crucial questions for harmonizing historical and translation study something like the following. How in any given text, in any given moment, is the foreign, the other, used, promoted, and valued? And then, in any given historical moment around that translation, how was the foreign other actually used in real life and valued in the culture at, at large? And what is the relationship between those two valuations, textual and, and historical, between the way the historical world around a translation used and valued alterity and the way the translated text foregrounds or filters, deploys or derails or denies the foreign? <laughs> 
Art is not life, of course, but the same questions can be asked of each, uh, coming with different answers, of course. A relationship between these four elements can be understood. Like, e likewise, every translation is made manifest in some textual medium, whether that be oral, manuscript, printed, filmic, or digital. And as I was making that list of media, I thought, well, why not musical? Why not orchomatical? Since the textual medium is an active substrate and reproducer, co-producer of meaning, medium as meta-language, we can also ask of any translation in the period, what does the textual technology that, trans that uh, bears the translation tell us about the use and valuation of alterity? Now, we can develop concepts and subconcepts and tools that join historical translation and translational considerations, and I hope we will. And I can think of tools that serve us already. Walter Ong's idea of residue, again, not designed for us, but speaks to us. Y. Chi Dimuk's theory of resonance, or McLeod's transformation. In fact, Lawrence Venuti's powerful, flexible concept of the translator's invisibility is just one such. And from it, we can develop um, all, all sorts of tools um, that, that are not located in one period. Um, I've recently published an article on something I'm calling visibility, and I hope, I hope Larry won't think it's a perversion of his concept. I, I won't drag you through that, but the point is you can take a great concept and um, spin off conceptual tools from it that, that work very well uh, across periods. The visibility of the foreign elements in a medieval codex may have meant one thing, one set of things, but the same visibility in a printed codex 50 or 75 or 175 or 200 years later must mean a very different set of things. So for anything we observe about translation, we want to observe it um, like the physicists observe particle wave and field theory in itself as a historical phenomenon and in a, in a broader field. So to be useful as transhistorical tools, any such concepts must not be taken for their own sake. Rather, they point to how alterity is handled. Um, we might brainstorm together more about this in the Q&A. I, I, I want to know what people in this audience have in mind, what tools might be created, used, what taxonomies might be devised to join these, these two uh, large fields of study. Now on to the cases. These cases are meant to show historical methods and translation theory mutually enriching and informing one another. Um, although necessarily with different results. The first two cases are of early Tudor books, the move in the, showing the move from manuscript to printed books. And then the later two cases are of late Tudor uh, Elizabethan context. We focus on Elizabethan context there. And then I do have a conclusion. It's got sort of a gloomy aspect to it, but I'll try to reduce that. All right, our first case. The Tudor, the Tudor Christine de Pizan offers us an example of how technology itself translates. It's an example of how translation intervenes in the history of authorship and the history of poetics. We're looking at British Library manuscript Harley 4431. This is a complete works of Christine de Pizan manuscript. It's dated about 1400 to 1405. And this folio shows the Proverbe Moreau, um, as you can see from the rubricated in Kippet and also from the running heads. This illuminated miniature uh, features Christine's self-fashioned authorship. And you'll notice that she's instructing four men. The, the young one in green with the short coat is thought to be her son. The other three are in clerical and scholarly clothing. This is a very unusual characterization for an unusual 15th century woman. Now, Christine de Pizan ran her own scriptorium. To control the means of production is also to be able to self-fashion. The page structure and decoration strategies of this book assert clearly her auctoritas and her authorship. Now, in the manuscript, the spacing, as you see, makes the couplet the main unit of poetic discourse. Each initial is rubricated separately, each a stately gem of aphoristic wisdom to be absorbed on its own terms in a, in a catenary fashion. Anthony Woodville's translation of this into English is verbally very close to the original. Uh, syntactically, it's what we call template translation, and it has, it's full of lexical cognates as well. Anthony Woodville was um, not only brother-in-law to King Edward IV, but he was patron and evidently some kind of literary friend 
to the young printer just starting out named William Caxton. They worked together on several texts, and when Caxton printed Woodville's template translation of Christine in 1478, the, the Moral Proverbs, his, uh, his visual presentation changed some very important things. The title you see here does preserve Christine's auctoritas and authorship. He writes a laudatory colophon poem calling her the mirror and mistress of intelligence, so he's not suppressing her in any way. And although this typeface aims to translate what Benjamin, if he had known about this, would have called the aura of script in the age of mechanical reproduction, and although the initial blank you see here leaves space for individual patronage, still the format allongé you see here and the spacing or lack thereof absolutely ignore the poetic singularity and the rhetoric of the couplet that ignores the, the aphoristic value and the encouragement of catenary reading that we saw in the manuscript. And of course, economics plays a huge role in the material part of this translation. But even working without illustrations, as Caxton had to do at that time, the printer and the translator preserve Christine's auctoritas. Likewise, in this 1526 reprint by Richard Pinson, that Francophone King's printer to Henry, the double column format is even more crowded and economical. Despite the translator's careful preservation of the words in each couplet, these printers both produce the thing as a narrative, which it is clearly not. They break the main poetic unit between pages, and yet still preserve Christine's authorship in the paratexts. Now, there are other aspects of material production that matter in this case. I hope you'll ask if you're interested about the signifying value of the visual translation from Caxton's Lombard script to the English black letter, Henrician black letter we have here. And especially, I hope you'll ask about the volume's choiring and comp composition and why that matters to the translation of this work and so many others. Uh, where our first case, among hundreds like it, shows translation and technology acting together on literary history, on matters of poetic form and authority, the second case shows printers and translators together responding to history in what is probably the most common pattern of early modern translation of all, and that is uh, the reusing and revaluing of the foreign past for times of new and urgent political crisis. This is one of the 18 or so manuscript copies of the Curial by Alain Chartier. Chartier's anti-court critique, written in French sometime before 1430, is a pseudo-epistle. It's imagined as a cautionary letter to his brother. And as you see, it's illustrated as such in this Anjou manuscript. The Curial presents a moral critique of aristocratic arrogance. And it was composed near the end of the Hundred Years' War when an exhausted, chaotic France was maneuvering between England and the Holy Roman Empire. Chartier names no names in his critique, but then he didn't need to. His coterie context was that of the treacherous late Valois courts. The Curial stresses the need to maintain one's personal ethics even at a corrupt court, instead of succumbing to pleasurable temptation or selling out or currying favor. Ideally, the work says, one should stay away from court entirely. The work says this to people at court because the work was produced as a luxury item within the patronage system of the late medieval manuscript codex, the elite consumers of this book were the very people whose culture and class are under critique in it. But once translated into English print, the work takes on new meanings in two printings at two different political flashpoints, 1483 and 1549. Now historians in the audience would perk up at those dates. Those were years of English rebellion, 1483, 1549, good grief. And this is the uh, 1483 version. Our friend Caxton translated and printed this, and he did so in the same year that Anthony Woodville was executed while trying to protect his uh, nephew princes from Richard III. Just as in late Valois France, England in the early 1480s, as Caxton and Woodville knew all too well, was a site of warfare, treachery, court arrogance, and intrigue. The relevance of Chartier's content is obvious, and the English translation is also template translation. But the paratexts of the two English versions shape the anti-court critique differently. Caxton expands the incipit here, naming the author, describing the work, explaining that 
a noble and virtuous earl asked him to translate it and saying that he's reduced it into English. Reduced was really uh, not a, it sounds like it's a diminishment, it sounds like it's diminishing the translation, but they, they intended that to mean organized, clarified, sifted, really, you know, reduced as one reduces a mathematical formula. Um, Caxton writes his own colophon poem as well here in a typical 15th century ballad form with a series of negative anaphoras that highlight the paradoxes of life at court, its necessary doubleness. The, the ballad is filled with negation and affirmation. It's sort of a giant speech act. There is no danger but vilain. There is no poor man but enriched. There is no pride, no pestilence, but in great seigneury. More than Caxton's verbal translation, his paratexts translate the uncomfortable frictions between Chartier's courtly production values and his condemnation of court life. Here in 1549, after the death of Henry VIII, it is Edward VI, not Edward IV, who is at risk. The same work is retranslated by Francis Seagar and probably printed by a man named William Sears, who was struggling at this point. Seagar we know better as a psalmist, and his poem in the Mirror for Magistrates is a harsh condemnation of Richard III. So the events of that prior rebellion of 1483 clearly had meaning for this mid-Tudor translator in 1549 during his own year of crisis. We only have a fragment of this book, three pages of a duodecimo, but even this shows Seagar's motivated amplifications to Caxton's work. As you can see, there's an expanded title set on its own page in a full triquet pattern, and it explains itself as newly augmented, amplified, and enriched by Francis Seeger, claiming the translator's prerogative on the title page. He adds a cautionary quatrain, and then on the verso, writes his own 20-line prefatory poem that is utterly unlike Caxton's courtly colophon ballad. You can see that Seeger's is in a common meter, ABAB. -A -B. It's not quite hymnal meter, but it's close cross rhyme quatrain stanzas. Um, it's mostly a cautionary meditation against Fortuna, but it ends with this pointed topical quatrain. All you that are called unto any high place, be true unto your anointed king, he means Edward, and call unto God to give you the grace so to continue to your lives ending. Amen, in uppercase. The Protestant printer and translator give this work new meaning in light of Kett's Rebellion, the Western Risings, the prayer book controversies, and the struggles around the Somerset Protectorship of 1549. So the new medium here makes a real difference. In French manuscripts, the Curial enjoyed the privacy of coterie readerships that would locate it safely in the speculum tradition of aristocratic advice literature. A letter from a brother, an individual counsel to young nobles. In manuscript, the critique of court would have been informative and sobering for the royal reader, cautionary to aspirers at court, consoling to some courtiers, and perhaps corrective to others. However, when translated into commercial print at mid-century, it would have reached many more readers not present at courts, and those whose relation to the court was not aspirational, but alienated, distant, oppositional, rebellious, taking up arms. In other words, translated not just into the new medium, but into the new medium's energized distribution systems of the Tudor mid-century, this anti-court letter takes on the character of an expose, activated in the world outside and below the court, and thus necessarily more critical and politicized when it's remediated. So that most typical pattern of retranslation and reprinting often highlights the topical potentials in foreign texts, um, translation relocates, but it also rehistoricizes. The translators and printers see and promote the present value of the foreign past. This case also shows the capacity of Chartier's old critique to speak truth to power in some radically different contexts. Okay, on to the Elizabethan cases with different things to teach us about Renaissance translation and its relation to history. This is the title page of the first translation into English of the Book of the Courtier, Thomas Hobby or Hobby's famous translation. There's a trend now to call him Thomas Hobby. Um, this was also printed by William Sears, by then, by this time, much more prosperous, as you can tell from the engraved title page. 
Castiglione's Il Cortigiano was already, by this time, one of the most important books in Europe. Beginning with the Aldine edition of 1528, it saw at least 125 editions before 1610 in six languages, as Peter Burke, Daniel Javich, Amadeo Quandam, and many other scholars have shown. It would be hard to overstate the resonance and impact of this book on European culture. This is the book that sets out how men and women are supposed to behave not only at court and toward the monarch, but toward one another. More than a conduct book, the courtier explores a philosophy of personal and social identity. It creates a politics. Although it speaks of an elite court-centered culture, in England it was read by elite and non-elite people alike. This is the book that gave us many of our modern ideas about power and powerlessness and about how to deal with the powerful, about gender, about talent and what makes a well-rounded person. This is the book that gave us the idea of sprezzatura, that attitude of graceful ease that makes difficult accomplishments seem relaxed and natural. This is the distant ancestor of our idea of cool. Now, the modern inheritance is another topic, but in the 16th century, translations of the courtier were everywhere. Although two generations of English readers had had this book mostly in French and Italian, Hobby Englishes it at mid-century, and it was printed in 1561, and the, the, you see the title page. Uh, like most Tudor translation, this is appropriative in direction and purpose. Here's what Hobie says of his translation. He says that he makes it to store the language, meaning to stock the language. He says, so that we alone, meaning we in England alone, may not be still counted barbarous in our tongue, as time out of mind we have been in our manners, the barbarous English. I'm living in London this semester, and they don't seem barbarous at all to me. <laughs> I'm the barbarian there. I, Hobie goes on to say, I know not by what destiny Englishmen are much inferior to most other nations where language and learning are concerned. And he's talking about the lack of translation. And he, he encourages every learned person to make some translation, please, and do it now. Um, he says that translation is learning itself. Yet despite this stated aim, Many valued Hobie's translation as what I might call prophylactic translation, translation that would prevent what was feared to be an unhealthy and diseased contact with the foreign. We think first here of the strange commendation of Hobie's courtier in Roger Ascombe's book, The Schoolmaster. He says, advisedly read and diligently followed, but one year at home in England, the book of the courtier would do a young gentleman more good, I wis, than three years travel abroad spent in Italy. And the rest of the, in the schoolmaster, he goes on ranting against the Italians and the Italianate Englishman and the danger of going to that dreadful place, Italy. Stefano, what do you think? <laughs> For Hobie, translation was to enrich the language and address Tudor England's language inferiority complex. For Ascom, Hobie's courtier translation was valuable precisely as a brief protective substitute for genuine, extended, and therefore dangerous cultural contact with a foreign other. This might seem stubborn or provincial or idiosyncratically xenophobic on Ascom's part, but he's not alone in this attitude. Many scholars have written about English xenophobia and the related anxieties. In the wider context of Elizabethan literary efforts to fashion gentlemen and ladies, as Spencer's preface says, in a tremendously mobile and increasingly multicultural society, Ascom's and Hobie's opinions seem typical in that they exemplify a persistent English ambivalence about the foreign. In Hobie's own translation, a margin note is placed, I hope we can see it, yes, um, in, in a significant section uh, to highlight and index the importance of learning foreign languages and engaging with foreign people and texts. So this combined repudiation and embrace of the foreign, the, this tension between many such expressed reservations and the continued flood of translation activity into English raises questions. Was the mediated armchair contact with a translated book really thought to be more beneficial than travel? If some English, and English printers and readers thought of translation as prophylactic in 1561, how about in 1588 when John Wolfe printed this trilingual edition in the year of the Spanish Armada. At that moment, how was the view of translation changing and the appropriative direction along with it? John Wolfe's trilingual format, which you see here, tells us a lot about this. This edition offers not a single new word to readers, 
We have here the Italian of Castiglione in center page at the gutters, the French of Gabriel Chapuis, mid-page in clean Roman, and Hobie's English black letter in the outer margins. In addition to the many foreign versions available in England at the time, there were, there were English editions of 1561 and 1577, and there were three Latin editions printed in England in 71, 77, and 85. Um, judging from the provenance records and marginalia I've seen, these editions were all widely owned, read, and scribbled in. Um, I, I had written here a brief history of the editions available in England, but it was so long. <laughs> it wasn't brief at all. I had to cut it out. Just trust me, lots of courtiers. No shortage of courtiers in England. With so many editions widely available and without a single new word printed here, what did this 616-page trilingual quarto contribute? Now, the traditional book trades reading might be that Wolf, the printer John Wolfe created a more saleable object aimed at a different market segment. That is, aimed at readers who did not want what the available English and Latin editions already offered, nor the foreign editions. That is, people who wanted neither an English-only courtier, Hobie's, nor the internationalism of the Latinate courtier. This multi-vernacular courtier engages quite another sensibility. Latinate internationalism and multi-vernacular internationalism imply and convey two very different kinds of courtiership. So what about the historical moment in which this was printed? This edition was entered in the Stationer's Register on the 4th of December, 1587. And that means that it was imagined and planned in a time of intensive national anxiety about the impending Spanish invasion. You will note there is no Spanish text here. The Boscan's Spanish text was widely available and very good. The, the edition actually appeared in, in late 1588 at a moment of relief a wave of English triumph, actually triumphalism, right after the Spanish Armada had failed to invade. Now, obviously, the content of the Cortegiano does not mention the Armada events. It was made in 1528. Um, nor do Wolfe's revised paratexts contain any topical update about the Armada news, just selections from the older editions. Yet this physical book of 1588 and its interpretive action as an edition does take a stand, I think, with respect to England's new international post-armada situation. Wolf prints other books in French and Italian, but this is his only trilingual publication, and the radical visibility here gives it a special place in the work's long polyglot history. This edition does not just mention translation. Whoops. We have lost our... Um, we have lost our images completely here. Wow. Um, can someone get help? <laughs> I'll, keep, I'll keep talking, but the images are going to be crucial because we're, gonna, we're starting to talk about page formats now. Okay. Um, it's very interesting. That's never happened before, especially not on camera. <laughs> Okay, Wolf prints other books in French and Italian, but this is his only trilingual publication, and it has a special place. The, the edition makes the translations the main feature of the book. Now, his interventions in the discursive field around this central text are, are neither um, linguistic translation, of course, nor are they retranslation, nor, I would say, are they merely the reproduction and repackaging of, of existing translations. Now, we know that every edition is an interpretation, and this one effectively translates the translations by setting them in relation to one another. They, he effectively brings the world into one book. Um, by granting this new visibility, his, his edition re-internationalizes the work and relocates the English courtier in a new relationship to the continent. And he makes this important work mean something new. And here's where I'm going to need to get some, uh, some, some images back. I've got images that prove without a doubt that he doesn't use Hobie's page format and page concept that, oh, you, Bob Hodgson. Here's something. Well, I have it here. Now maybe we can get it here. Hi! Yay! Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, Wolf kept all of Hobie's words, but he rejected his mise en page. This is the 1561 page with marginalia. Printed marginalia imply an indexed text, a text to be consulted, 
As Guida Armstrong has argued, printed marginalia are pre-packaging the usual commonplacing function that we find in Renaissance manuscripts. Um, and, and she argues that printed marginalia redeploy the commonplacing function between books and among books in given readers' libraries. That's a separate argument. But Wolf certainly rejected the, the potentials of this printed marginalia page, of this page format. Instead, he appears to have based his mise en page on the three French editions that were made between 1580 and 1585, these bi-column bi French editions. To this bi-column page design, which this one is Gabriel Chapuis printed in 1585, Wolf adds, Finds, it, finds a place for English in the black letter outer margins. He asserts effectively a parity among versions. Now, we can talk later, if you like, about the implications of these typefaces. Typefaces are themselves a meta language. They developed national and class associations over time. And that's, again, that's a, something we could talk about if you're interested. Now, you might detect in Wolf's new mise en page a subtle spatial geographical analogy at work the central text, the mediating text, and finally the exiled island text, the, most, the outermost reaches of the barbarian England. Um, though this motion from textual origin outward does mimic the translatio studii, which is after all the West's central paradigm for textual transmission and literary historiography, I would not want to push that analogy between position on the page and position in the world, and the reason I wouldn't is that multilingual column formats were just too common and too variable for that. It might look like a nice argument here, but I don't think it really holds water across cases. However, there is a clear action on the English reader that is created by Wolf's catchword strategy. The catchwords, you know, are the little, um, at the bottom of the page, which guide printers and readers in uh, putting the pages together. The catchword strategy does some peculiar things. In any given page opening, the English reader's eye must move down the outer verso column, that's the left-hand column, down to the bottom, to this point, and then up and across a continent of French and Italian and central Italian and mediating French back to the outer recto to continue reading in English. That is a motion back and across to continental origins. It's a motion of nostalgia, perhaps, certainly of emulation and, and of literary historiography. But most of all, it would be a stubborn and provincial English eye indeed, and maybe an anxious and xenophobic English eye, that would not stop to consider the French and Italian words and to wonder how other expressions of these key ideas might actually work. A more active English reader, an open English reader, would learn to use these alternative expressions. The process of reading would become, thanks to the cooperations of printing and translation on the page, an insistent encounter with the foreign, just the kind of thing we love. So to conclude this case, there was no shortage of courtiers in England, not a single new word here. Wolf's transformation without translating uh, reforms with an E, that's a book history pun, uh, one of the century's most influential works at a key moment for English nationhood. This encourages an internationalized English courtiership and an English transnationalism at the brink of the post-armada moment, right on the post-armada moment. Okay, if Wolfe's use and valuation of the foreign was heuristic and sensitive to its moment and invitational rather than prophylactic, our final case for today shows a strongly motivated and propagandistic response to an event in history, to that event. This case, uh, this sheet was also printed in late 1588. It uses multilingual printing and translation in openly celebrating the Armada events. This is um, Ad Serenissimam Elisabethan. This broadside was printed by Ralph Newberry and George Bishop, who were Queen's printers, in 1588. This rarely discussed, but I think remarkable, single sheet folio um, presents a Latin epigram by Théodore de Bèze with verse translations of it in eight languages. One of the three extant copies of this sheet is on vellum. No copies on paper or vellum are extant outside England, and no copy is known ever to have left England. No one has written about this that I can find after a year of searching. Um, if you hear of anyone who has said anything about this, please let me know. <laughs>
The Latin and English poems turn up later here and there, but this spectacular translation object itself appears to have performed a curiously insular kind of transnationalism. Unlike Wolfe's open codex, this sheet was aimed at a very narrow, very elite English audience, and possibly an audience of one, just the queen. No translators have been identified, but I've made tentative discoveries about two of the people associated with this sheet's printing. The work's material features, its dual appearance on paper and vellum, very fine white vellum too, by the way. The copies in the British Library is, is just gorgeous. It's this big. Um, its careful mise en page, and especially its poetics, which we'll talk about most here, all raise questions about reading and literary nationhood and about the relationship between history and translation. The printers and translation put the world on one page to ventriloquize an imaginary chorus of world voices, each using its own language and poetics, to project a militantly English understanding of the event. As a broadsheet, it appears an announcement to an implied world readership, but that readership seems to have been a fantasy readership. Its vellum skin aims it at one most serene and polyglot reader, Elizabeth. Now, uh, before we get into it, I need to issue a warning. Whatever I say here only applies to the languages that I'm able to work in, so I cannot tell you about the Hebrew, the Dutch, or the Greek, except for a little bit. And I, I don't find the Italian poem very interesting. That's probably because of my bad Italian. Um, not the, we can't blame that on the poem. But for time's sake, also, we'll just be talking about four of the eight languages on the page. The different poetics imply shifts in historical emphasis and cultural perspectives. Um, all the, the versions share the same basic content. They start by asking, what motivated the Spanish fleet? The answer, greed, an ambition to seize England for the Spanish crown. The English version adds here, pride. Next, they asked, what saved the day? The answer, Queen Elizabeth. Not a single word about the weather, except that the wind and waves did serve Elizabeth. No kidding. And finally, a long may she reign section finishes up, and that section varies, interestingly, among versions. They're all triumphalist, but each is, stands in relation to its own poetic tradition. This is the mother poem, the Latin epigram by Théodore de Bèze, and we'll go, we're going to look closely at it in just a moment, but I just want to go through the sheet itself. The English is notably not a sonnet, but a set of four iambic pentameter cisins. The cisin in England was a versatile Elizabethan workhorse, as useful to Raleigh and Shakespeare for their long narratives as it was to Thomas Watson in making a sonnet sequence, the Hecatompathia. Um, the main device in English that departs from Beza's Latin is, unfortunately, alliteration. And it, as you can see, the Spanish fleet did float in narrow seas and bend her ships against the English shore. It's not, it's not wonderful. Um, <laughs> the Dutch poem is a sonnet, and I can't read it, but we can thank Roger Kewen, who can read it, and who told me that the poem uses vivid Dutch-inflected seagoing metaphors. And he also says that the typesetting suggests that someone who was a non-native speaker of Dutch did the, did the compositing here. The Spanish is the most amplified version. It is in the arte mayor form of unrhymed verse, in this case, 22 unrhymed lines plus a couplet. It's a special syllabic form, the arte mayor, 11 or 12 syllables with the penultimate syllable heavily stressed. This verse form contrasted with the arte menor short line verse, which was more common and less formal. The arte mayor occupies a particular position in the Spanish literary system of its day. This was the form Boscan renovated from the three stress pattern medieval chivalric verse line. He brought it out to become the highest, most elegant Renaissance form in Spain. And the choice of this form for this sheet points to Spain's new cosmopolitanism, which, of course, is not unproblematic in this context. Um, I think we could also listen to the motion of the new Arte Mayor line. Its motion being a long suspense, strong emphasis and fall. Suspense, emphasis, fall. Something like what must have been the experiential arc of the Armada events themselves from, from the Spanish view. The Arte Mayor form is trendy. It's forward looking, but also backward looking with an elevated register and a, a real formality and seriousness. Then on the page, we have a Hebrew epigram and a Greek epigram, and I thank here Mark Schachter for pointing out to me that these ligatures 
are just as finely done as the puns in the poem are done. Uh, the Italian signaled as an eloquent vulgarization, perhaps a deep, deep gesture to Dante, I don't know. The French is a very skillful poem. It's a sonnet en alexandrin, rime embrassé, and it reminds me most of the long line sonnets in Dubélé's Antiquité de Rome sequence. This compact French poem adds a miniature allegory, adds several classical allusions and some really good phonetic effects. It is a Pléiade style sonnet, and that means that in 1588, this poem would have looked very snazzy indeed to English readers who had not yet experienced the great sonnet craze of the 1590s. But in the French literary system, it would have been on the moldy side of classic, if not completely backward looking. I mean, in 1588, the only Pléiad poet still living was Baif. Hmm. At the bottom, you see a little epigram to the author, probably from the translator. So the translators chose signifying forms in each tradition. Clearly not just any epigram would do, nor would experimental odes, nor arte menor short lines. These poems are clearly not just cribs for monoglot foreigners. Some more than others, each displays its own high culture engagements and pretensions. And oddly, the English displays the least of those. Let's look more closely at how each version shifts slightly the political and historical emphasis. Théodore de Bèze was not just a prolix theologian, but as Anne Prescott has pointed out, an accomplished Neo-Latin poet. The translations each adapt his techniques, his use of repetitions with contrast, his use of paradoxical ploque, his use of parallel relatives and repeated verbs, and even a little sound play, unusual in Latin. The translators imitate his flashy antithesis and his antimetaboly, all trying for the wow factor of those chiastic structures in the final lines. Readers of Latin would have certainly seen its many rhetorical colors, which the translators tried to convey too, each in its own vernacular. The content of each version also varies subtly where the monarchy is concerned. Elizabeth, for one thing, is not quite the same queen in each version. From the singular glory of all the world, we get a sacred queen praise of the world, which is not the same thing as an uppercase queen above all others blessed, nor is that an Italian wise queen who is also not exactly the peerless queen pearl of the universe. Now this French line, reine sans père, perle de l'univers, is of course phonetically lovelier than the others, more than most of the others. Sadia regina is not bad. And it uses this French line, the very phrase, that was used to speak of French royal women, as in Jean Vesou's sonnet to Marguerite de Navarre, or Flaminio Birag's poetic dedication to Marguerite de Navarre. The pearl queen Marguerite and Queen Elizabeth, of course, were joined in the Protestant imaginary. Certainly, it's a more luscious line than O Queen above all others blessed. Also, the vernacular translations retain the Latin poem's antithetical closing structures, but the queen's relation to her subjects and England's relation to the world are cast differently in each language. Beza's Latin hopes chiastically that she and England will have a long and fruitful relation to one another. In French, soit longtemps à l'anglais is not too much different. The Spanish amplifies to three lines, and the English italicizes. Now the French laissez hopes that she and the English will be left to each other. There's a little minor slam possibly there. The Spanish gozer captures what's in fruaris somewhat better. But tus vasallos, that your vassals will please you and you them, well, that certainly clarifies the relationship between monarch and subject with more than a trace of lingering feudalism. This is really not the kind of queen Elizabeth imagined herself to be. The translations construct different distances between monarch and subject, and the Spanish spans the greatest distance. Most versions also retain the Latin moral categories of bonis et malis. The hope is that Elizabeth will be as much a delight to good people as a terror of evil ones. In Spanish, Siendo del bueno amada y tan querida, cuanto del malo tu virtud temida, preserves the moral categories and adds that it's her virtud that will be loved by the good and feared by the bad. And of course, virtud is a, is a perfect tag for the female monarch who said she had the heart and stomach of a king. A difference in the French, effroyable méchant, des vertueux aimés, hopes she will be scary to the mean ones, 
les méchants, they're not quite as evil as los malos, are they? And that she'll be loved by the virtuous. Note that les vertueux are a particular kind of good person, and note also that the virtue is theirs, not Elizabeth's, in the French version. In English, however, friend and foe are not moral but relational categories. Here it's not about evil or good nature of other nations, but about alliances. Reading the English version, one more easily imagines fluid transnational relations, the diplomatic realignments that in fact did and do occur over time. So the subtle differences add up. The Spanish version is the loftiest with an image of the queen's subjects as poor vassals who elsewhere in the poem need her financial support. The French is intellectualizing. The aesthetic line of the Pleiade, strong here, culturally hegemonic, the French version, even if it's dated at home. The English cisin do the verbal labor in their iambic pentameter, but somehow they manage neither the hidalgo elevation of the Spanish nor the elegant compression of the French. The poems display themselves as participating in the respective literary nationhoods, the poetic forms of each nationhood. Obviously here we have a strongly motivated use and valuation of the foreign in a very high visibility format. One thing to note first about mise en page is the lack of black letter. Very speculatively now, we could also observe that the mise en page works in two temporal dimensions. Current news in the left column, notice how the Dutch is squeezed between the Spanish and the English, just as in the wars, and the longer, broader arc in the right-hand column. Read this way, the layout of this chorus of world voices casts the Armada as a world current event and also in a very long historiography with a quick nod to Sallust. I have a, a section here about readerships, but I've been given a 10-minute cue, so I'm going, to, I'm going to move beyond that and just say that the ultimate reader is the addressee Elizabeth, famously polyglot and a translator herself since at least the age of 11. But we don't know and maybe can't know who else the real readers of that sheet actually were. We can see the intensive imaginary at work, however, the effort to celebrate England in a chorus of world languages past and present on a page both transnational and transhistorical signaling the printer's and translator's use of the foreign in constructing the English. And we, too, get the message in any language for any reader in any period. It's don't mess with Bess. <laughs> so um, to conclude now, in connecting translating in history, translation and history, if we aim for conceptual tools that are adaptable transhistorically, and if we keep an eye on the how of translation, especially to include interaction with media substrates and the an interaction of the substrates with the linguistic text they carry, then we can discuss our material with translation scholars in any period, with historians, and with interested people outside those fields too, because every text comes to us on, in, a, in, a, in a substrate of some kind. And now the gloomy note. I think a much bigger problem than how to integrate historical study and translation study is how to integrate translation study into institutions. The long-term health of translation study depends on the quality of foreign language curricula, which in turn depends ultimately on the legislatures that vote on education funding. The health of cherished things in our world far outside translation studies also depends on this. The kind of world I want to live in is one in which mutual understanding is actualized across all kinds of alterities and in any medium. As we all work on this pragmatic side of the question of how to use and value things foreign, whether through political action or by strengthening curricular requirements in our universities or in our children's schools, please let's do it there, we can also keep an open mind about our own disciplinary boundaries just as the early printers and translators found, a boundary need not mean a halt, for it also locates a conjunction, a contact, a generative place. I hope the disciplinary line between historical and translation studies can be so for us too. So let us not be diverted by false methodological borders and binaries. Let us continue to learn each other's methods and develop new conceptual tools. Let us play in these fields. Let us pose the shared questions at the heart of our work about the use and valuation of the foreign and about ever-changing encounters with alterity. Let a thousand methods bloom. Thank you. Thank you.